Up next on The Reveal. She approached me, you know what I mean? I didn't know what to do. I was, you know, I was 15. I was. Claims of unreported abuse and sexual misconduct against a state agency responsible for rehabilitating children. It wasn't taking me seriously. They would, they were throwing away my write-ups. The officers will talk openly about these relationships to each other. They don't think anything is wrong with it, and they'll do it in front of other staff members. We confront the agency's director about the claims. Are you, you aware of any incidents that are not being reported at your facilities? The reveal begins now with investigators Faith Abube and Andy Parati. Welcome to The Reveal. Tonight, we uncover multiple claims of unreported abuse and misconduct against a state agency responsible for rehabilitating children. The Georgia Department of Juvenile Justice tried to prevent The Reveal from obtaining what we're about to show you. Did they know this was being recorded? Tora Polite is about to watch a video she's been waiting to see for nearly two years. Just bleach this. It's video of her then 15-year-old son, Wontavious Moore, handcuffed behind his back while held on by a corrections officer with the Department of Juvenile Justice. And then this happens. You've got an officer who's 240, 250, six feet plus, slamming a kid to the ground and his arms behind his back in handcuffs. Like he's not a human, like he's just a freaking animal or something. The impact to the ground so hard, it breaks the child's arm. Heartbreaking. Nathaniel Holderbrook is the family's attorney. The video doesn't have sound. What do you think it would have sounded like? I think you would have heard a 15-year-old kid screaming for his life. Those screams appear to fall on deaf ears as two other officers watch it unfold. And they are walking as though they're just having a Sunday stroll. No one is in a hurry to do anything. According to a pending lawsuit, the officer was taking more back to a cell after he accused the teen of stealing food. At the time, Moore was in custody for felony theft. You're talking about breaking a child's arm because you believe he took an extra sandwich. It happened at the Sumter Youth Development Campus in 2016, a sprawling 50-acre facility which houses 54 juveniles in America's Georgia. And this isn't the first time an officer has been accused of misconduct there. According to agency records, over the past four years, it recorded 460 alleged cases at the facility. DJJ opened an investigation on less than half of the reported claims. It was really like walking into hell on earth, in my opinion. Matthew Flornow is a former corrections officer who worked at a different DJJ facility about five years ago, operated by a contractor. When he tried to report violations, Floor now says supervisors often looked the other way. They wasn't taking me seriously. They would they were throwing away my write-ups. According to an internal investigation, three youth defenders brutally attacked Floor now months into his job. Floor now was cited for hitting one of them back. The 29-year-old believes fellow officers allowed it to happen after his repeated attempts to report violations. He settled a lawsuit against the contractor DJJ hired for what he believes was retaliation at an agency he was told rehabilitates youth. From me, from my personal experience, all of that was just bull. There was no rehabilitation in your opinion no, happening? No, it was a daycare for Satan's children. Back at the Sumter DJJ facility, more signs of trouble. This past summer, nearly 40 youth offenders overpowered a corrections officer and gained access to the roof. Their plan was to leave the boys up there until they decided to come down. While DJJ won't disclose how it happened, according to staffing records obtained by the reveal, the facility reported security staffing is a concern months before the incident, disclosing it cannot fill about 50 vacancies. And earlier this month, the former director of the facility filed this whistleblower lawsuit claiming he repeatedly requested funding 
because staffing shortages were causing safety concerns. After a security breach last year, the agency fired him. It's normal to come to work in here who, well, who's the next person that quit today? That was the norm. It's a problem DJJ has known about for years. In 2014, a state audit found turnover rate of 49% makes it difficult for DJJ to provide a safe environment. It also identified inexperienced officers may contribute to the frequency and type of incidents. <sighs> DJJ fired the officer for hurting Polite's son. It was the second time the agency cited the officer for a violation within two months. How are we rehabilitating children while we're abusing them? You can't rehabilitate when there's an atmosphere of distrust. Next on The Reveal, more allegations of officers covering up misconduct this time claims of sexual assault. This happened to a child when he was 15 years old. 15 years old. And it looks like they just don't care. We confront the agency director about the claims. So you have you a few seconds. I want to talk about some security yeah, and safety I'm, concerns. I'm doing some things right okay. now. Okay. Are Thank you me. aware of any incidents that are not being reported at your facility? If you have a news tip or a comment on one of our investigations, email us at thereveal at 11alive.com. Welcome back to The Reveal. A teenager once incarcerated with the Georgia Department of Juvenile Justice claims one of his corrections officers sexually assaulted him and other officers allowed it to happen. The allegations aren't just from children. One top security officer claims it's pervasive agency-wide. So for the purposes of this interview, we're going to call you James and use an animation. Are you okay with that? Yes, sir. What do you know about why you're here today? Uh, for the purpose of what happened at Muskogee. And what is Muskogee? The detention center. Within days of arriving at the Department of Juvenile Justice facility in Columbus, Georgia in 2016, someone took notice of James, a corrections officer named Phonicia Hill. She was 29 years old, James 15. The grooming started with gifts. What kind of gifts? Like food and stuff. Anything I wanted, drinks, anything. James says the corrections officer wrote him letters, too. Then came the late-night phone calls, speaking hours on the phone. Many times, James says, Hill called from inside the facility. My other officers knew about it. They knew about what was going on. Really? Yeah, they will hand me the phone. Then one day, Hill allegedly took James to an area without security cameras watching. It was a little room chemical closet, you know, and we was in there one night, and she messed around and started kissing me, but she approached me, you know what I mean, I didn't know what to do, I was you know, about 15. I was... According to James, the relationship only stopped after a custodian found one of Hill's letters in his cell. DJJ fired Hill, and she currently faces sexual assault charges. James explained what happened to his mom. I barely could get it out to her, you know. Mm -hmm. I had to write it down on a piece of paper. And he wrote it down. He wrote everything down. This is James's mother. We're calling Tanya. When I read what he wrote, I was, I was very belligerent. I was very, very belligerent. Tanya says she tried to get answers from the facility director. I was like, is it a male or female? He laughed. I can't tell you that. I said, what do you mean you can't tell me that? Well, it's, it, by, by being under investigation, I can't tell you. According to agency records obtained by the reveal, staff reported 5,200 sex-related misconduct violations involving two or more people at its secure facilities. DJJ opened an investigation into just 8% 
of those cases. It was just a culture. They just didn't care. They... Jay Lockerbie is the former head of security at the agency's Augusta facility. In his year working on the campus, he says sex between staff and juveniles was pervasive. And the thing that dumbfounds me with it is they, the officers will talk openly about these relationships to each other. And they, they don't think anything is wrong with it, and they'll do it in front of other staff members. It's that blatant. It's that blatant. The longtime law enforcement veteran says DJJ fired him after he punched the juvenile, who he says attacked him first. But before he left, he says he gave up trying to report incidents. Because it was easier to just hide it than to deal with it. To me, it's corrupt all the way up. For answers, we reached out to DJJ Commissioner Avery Niles. He's headed the agency for six years. At first, Niles agreed to talk when we were ready. But when we asked to schedule that interview months later, he declined. So we caught up with him after a recent board meeting. You have a few seconds. I want to talk about some security yeah, and safety I'm, concerns. I'm doing some things right now. Okay. Listen, listen to me. I would be more than happy to talk with you as soon as all of these litigation issues are taken care of. Are Thank you me. aware of any incidents that are not being reported at your facilities? Thank you. About a year after Hill's arrest, James says the former corrections officer continued contacting him, sending these selfies with the message, you haven't heard from me in a while, gotta be in disguise. What the officers had going on, that they know that we had going on, you know, they didn't bring it to the director's attention, because I feel like that was wrong. This happened to a child when he was 15 years old, 15 years old. And it looks like they just don't care. So what happened to that officer accused of sexually assaulting the teenager? A grand jury has indicted her and her trial could convene in the next few months. James's mother is in the process of filing a lawsuit against the agency for failing to protect her son. So far, any response from lawmakers? You know, State Senator Emanuel Jones, who helped lead the charge for the last criminal justice reform involving juveniles, says he's disturbed by the reveal's findings, and he plans to compel the state auditor to launch a review specifically looking into unreported violations. Coming up, drivers across the country are paying an annual tax on what the state believes their car is worth. But are they paying too much? I'm going to ask you this flat out. Is NADA providing you guys with overinflated prices? Property taxes are high enough in Georgia. But imagine having to pay annual taxes on whatever the government thinks your vehicle is worth. A few years ago, Georgia opted out of the so-called birthday tax, but the law remains on the books in at least 25 states, and residents of the state of Kentucky have had enough. Buying a car from any lot, you'll likely see inflated prices. The MSRP, the accessories, the warranties. $39.95, $11.9995. Price haggling doesn't have to end with the sale. 49 Because every year, taxpayers pay the price for driving a car in Kentucky. 32. A price set by the state. What the state says your car is worth. You want to keep your reminder card? Making it worthwhile to tax you have a good day. at registration. That's the way the game is played. Ron Aubrey owns a 2004 Jeep Wrangler. Mm. I think they have it at about six grand. 6,500 to be exact. Not worth it, he says. No, no. It's got holes in it and needs a. Uh, Needs a lot of work. Clearly, the higher your car is valued, the more valuable in taxes. On the state level. On our projection report, I think it was 140 million. And the local level. The clerk gets 4%. A 2016 Mini Cooper assessed at just over $19,000. A 2010 Ford Explorer at 5,650 bucks. And a 2006 Hyundai Tucson at an even 2,600. It's fair cash value. 
That's the Constitutional. The Commonwealth's Constitution defines that as the price it would bring at a fair voluntary sale. Statute calls it an average trade, but the Kentucky Department of Revenue interprets it all as a clean trade. It's condition on January 1. Thanks to an annual $124,000 subscription with the National Auto Dealers Association. Clean represents no mechanical defects and passes all necessary inspections with ease. In print in the NADA book. Paint, body, and wheels may have minor surface scratching with a high gloss finish. The definition is equivalent to what you would find. With all equipment in complete working order. In Kelly Blue Book as good condition. But even in very good condition, the trade is significantly disproportionate with NADA and more in line with trades on cars.com, which uses Black Book. Meanwhile, that 06 Tucson, well, there's confusion. EXDA. Oh, I went yeah. off the VIN yeah. and I made sure it was the exact right model. Although NADA assessed it for 2018 at $2,600, one year older and this month online, it's actually valued $600 more. It leads me to believe that that vehicle's been adjusted at some point. The owner swears that never happened. I'm gonna ask you this flat out. Is NADA providing you guys with overinflated prices? Not that I'm aware of. From what I've been told, NADA more closely represents the fair cash value, which is a sale between a willing buyer and a willing seller. So what can your car really fetch? Well, we took two of our own vehicles over to Neil Huffman Acura at Oxmoor to get their version of an accurate assessment. First up for inspection, this 2013 GMC Terrain. Fully loaded. With 78,000 miles on it. Used car director Brian Eubelhart has assessed thousands of cars. Also to see if Maybe there's a check engine light on. I wouldn't exactly say clean condition. Like I said, there's some repairs that are necessary. And unfortunately, the repairs I'm talking about are costly. That headlight assembly is gonna run about $800. This rear bumper repaint is gonna probably cost somewhere around $300. So that's why I would classify it as good condition. Next up, our 16-year-old Ford Escape. I look at the VIN number, to, that'll tell me what model year it is. With 132,000 miles. <laughs> Interior tears. This will have to be replaced. And exterior rust. One panel and it's gonna to have to be replaced. This vehicle is nowhere near clean condition. As a matter of fact, it's in rough shape. For what it's worth. Somewhere around $500. That's almost triple the state's $1,350 assessment. Most of the time it's just unrealistic. NADA traditionally overvalues cars? Yes, they always have. They always have. In that clean to excellent condition, you're looking at 5% of the cars that we look at. People need to know that they can dispute that. This is where that happens. Okay, I have a title. Appeals at your respective county's property valuation administrator's office. We'll review the information and we'll need some proof. The motor vehicle tax or MOTAX director of Jefferson County, John Elgin. Right there. Says higher than usual miles and damage. Big dings and scratches and it's not clean anymore. Pictures. Can help your case. Can you provide us with a estimate of repair? But the truth is most don't appeal. Two reasons. Most people take it as sort of a cost of having an automobile. And secondly, they really don't know that they can do it. Doesn't help that the small print on the back of the mailer is just a line within a line. And it's not very prominent. No, it's not. No, it's not. I think it's worth one thing. You can't sell it for that. Ron Aubrey also didn't know he could appeal. No, no, no. But he's already paid his 2019 car taxes on his $6,500. They want the money, I want to live here. 15 year old Jeep with the holes in it. Give it to him. After reaching out several times, NADA finally got back to us saying that 25 states charge an annual car property tax. And NADA provides vehicle valuations for 22 of them. The association points out that it has a staff of more than 20 analysts consistently researching car values. For The Reveal, I'm John Charlton. If you have a news tip or a comment on one of our investigations, email us at thereveal at 11alive.com.
You've been watching The Reveal, a show dedicated to impact investigations. And make sure to join us for a Reveal primetime special this Thursday at 10 p.m. We'll see you then. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.